Uh, no slides. No slides. No slides. talk about the blockchain, right? Uh, it's going to be a talk at a fundamentally different level from the blockchain. The blockchain is a how, right? Blockchain is a very, you know, sophisticated technology. It's a family of technologies. It's a technology that gives birth to other It's all of these things. But the blockchain is fundamentally a how, right? This is going to be a talk about the why, and it's going to be a talk about how to explain to people what the blockchain is about. Not as in teaching them the how and expecting them to figure out the why, but teaching them the why so they don't have to worry about the how. So it's talk about how to communicate. It's also talk about what the long-term technological implication of blockchain is. Um, now, <clears throat> quick show of hands. How many people could sit down in front of the computer and hand optimize an SQL query? That's terrifying. <laughs> <laughs> My God, you are nerdy. So normally, when I stand up and say that, like there'll be like, one hand at the back, me, I can do SQL. Right. But for people that are not hand optimizing their SQL queries, I guess it must be because my SQL started here, right? No. Okay. So, so, anyway, in any case, blow it away. In any case, for people that are not hand optimizing SQL queries. When somebody says, how does the blockchain work? Can you explain Bitcoin mining? The answer is, no, you don't need to know. Because actually, mining is a low-level technical operation at much the same level of the architectural staff as uh, you know, query optimizers, right? parsers. You don't need to know. Nobody cares. So let's go and think about why. And by the way, I should introduce Thomas, too. So this is my friend Thomas, who I was not expecting to be about. Thomas runs a 100-person organization which writes software to finance sustainable development. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Open source software. So, Non-profit, not for loss. Uh, we work with 20 governments, Africa, Asia, South America, and hundreds of NGOs, and several human organizations, primarily about data. Helping them collect data so they can make better decisions. And um, that, that's enough. Nobody's ever heard of us, but we're a very marginal space, but we might actually do something important. Yeah. He's being incredibly Swedish about this. They've got about <laughs> 3 billion euros of other people's money on the platform currently being spent digging wells in places that don't even have names. <laughs> right? This is real infrastructure on which people's lives depend. And what we're going to do is I'm going to fresh out this Internet of Agreements thing in the abstract, and then we're going to talk about if you were going to do this after thing today, would it be 100 people and an enormous stack of PHP, or would it be five people in a set of smart contracts? You know, this is basically a financial services agreement. What does it take to produce that in a decentralized way? So <clears throat> the original purpose behind Bitcoin was a global anarcho-capitalist revolution. It was intended to disenfranchise the nation state and to facilitate a global system in which capitalism was the only law. That is the why of Bitcoin. And anybody that tells you any different is lying. Right? Now, the how is this very clever distributed database. The why is anarcho-capitalism. Hands up everybody that likes anarcho-capitalism and thinks it should be the only global system. <laughs> One man, maybe two. Okay. 
So this is your first problem with blockchain story. The blockchain story is taking the how of Bitcoin, pulling it out, and putting it behind a different why. Now, I have flirted with anarcho-capitalism when I was much younger. I've also flirted with communism and socialism and anarcho-syndicalism. You know, any way you turn the political Rubik cube and you finally look on the other side, it's got six different colors on it. Right? There is no solution to the political Rubik's Cube. We keep turning it around and all of the answers we have are wrong. Right? So there is no point in attempting to take a political solution to the world's problems and scale it globally because they're all flawed. We haven't fixed it yet. It's kind of like doing physics before we understood conservation of energy. We have not figured out what the fundamental principles of politics are. All of our solutions are improvised craft solutions. There is no political science. Right? So, there is no doubt at all that the Bitcoin vision of the future at the why level is wrong. Because all politics is wrong, axiomatically it's wrong. <laughs> it can you get a kind of diff it can kind of work for some things some of the times and you can have some inexact trade-offs, but axiomatically if it's a political solution it will turn out to be enormous trouble. And that trouble is just human history. We don't know how to do this. It's like medicine is inexact. All medical treatments have side effects, all political systems have problems. So the whole rebranding of Bitcoin as blockchain is an attempt to detach the anarcho-capitalist why, take it out to the back of the field, whack it on the head with a shovel until it stops moving and bury it. Right? <clears throat> and this, needless to say, makes the anarcho-capitalists very upset, as it rightly should, because they're being disenfranchised. They thought that the solution that they had proposed technologically would get carried forward by the success of the technology until it became widespread social change. And it turns out that people are really good at resisting that kind of hijacking in their societies, and they just kind of kung fu the thing in two, take the part that's useful and throw away the stuff they don't want. <laughs> what this leaves is blockchain is now simply a tool for continued expansion of regular capitalism, which is like anarcho-capitalism only with entrenched monopolies and governments mandating what you're allowed to sell. Whoops. That might not be the answer either. Right? We, we clearly are not in a better position, but it's a different position. So what I want to propose is a new version of the why for blockchain. Something which is not political, because all political solutions are automatically wrong, but something which might improve basic human quality of life, even if it succeeded. And this is called internet agreements. It's a simple narrative. Does everybody know that in the old days, the internet couldn't handle credit cards? There was no credit card processing on the internet because there was no way to secure the credit card number. Right? There was a web browser, but it had no crypto. So in that phase, we had an internet of ideas because all that you could do was freely share ideas. And the internet of ideas ran until the very late 1990s when credit card processing was invented, and you get 10 years of explosive growth in basically catalog shopping buy things off the internet, and it's the same business model as catalog shopping, it's just electronic catalogs and electronic payments. And that produces 10 years of astonishing economic growth. Catalog shopping for goods, for books, for cars, for dates, for uh, you know, whatever it is you want. You need it, catalog shopping. Now, along comes all this blockchain stuff, and we take the tiny, tiny little sliver of cryptography that produces the padlock on the thing that takes your credit card details, and we add to it all of the rest of the cryptography that's been invented since about mid-1990. We've got hashes, we've got distributed hash tables, we've got zero-knowledge proofs, we've got hash cache, we've got all of these different things get piled on to the internet to produce another generation of transformation. From just a tiny bit of cryptography, we get this entire kind of e-commerce period. We take the rest of the cryptography and add it, and what we get is the ability to successfully represent all of the rest of the financial instruments that currently exist and to generate entirely new families of financial instruments. We also get the ability to reliably handle coordination problems that involve untrusted parties cooperating. Like, I say that the box has not been delivered, you say the box has been delivered. We don't trust each other because we don't know each other and cryptography can solve that handle problem. So now, the possibility is that we're going to see something happen like what happened for credit card processing and e-commerce for the entire rest of the financial system and much of the rest of the architecture of trade, including things like shipping, container shipping, delivery, transport, payments,
cross-border agreements, currency conversions, and every other kind of contract and agreement, including things like ICOs, which are basically share offerings, but not quite for So does that make sense as a basic story about what this blockchain thing is for? It's the next phase of the internet in which we take all the rest of trade, all the rest of the financial system, and we modernize it onto a cryptographic platform so it's secure, reliable, and cheap. That's a good buy story, right? Yeah. If you have a socialist society, you build your taxation stuff directly into the blockchain, your taxes are automatically collected, your welfare state never runs out of money. If you have some weird dictatorship, you make sure the people who have said something naughty about the president get double the tax rate. We're not talking about this as something which is instead of politics. We're talking about something which brings down the cost of whatever it is you want to do anyway, which leaves more money left over to do useful work on real problems, and less work is spent on accountants and lawyers. And I think we can all agree that spending less money on accountants and lawyers is an unmitigated <laughs> social <laughs> Right? Because those are how people. They're not why people. Accountants and lawyers make sure what you want me to do gets done. They don't make anything happen. So, does this sort of make sense as a story? Next time somebody says, what is the blockchain? Are you going to explain it in terms of blocks and hashes? Or are you going to say, once upon a time the internet couldn't process any credit card transactions, then we've got credit card transactions, now we're doing everything else. And we're doing it because an efficient society is a fair society. Make sense? Okay. Any very brief questions, and then we'll move on to the case study. No questions? Great. I feel like I missed something. <laughs> oh, globalization 2.0. Very briefly, the next talk in here will be by my friend Rob, who's going to talk about globalization 2.0. It's after the break. Globalization 2.0 basically says, right, global trade, local regulation, computers handle the red tape. And it's what happens when you say, OK, we like the internet agreements, but we want to do trade across a border, and we don't want it to be black market trade, so we'd like to obey the law. Could you please give us a machine oracle representation of the law so we can check whether what our robot delivery truck will do is legal before the truck tries and gets arrested? Don't ask me how you arrest a robot truck. <laughs> Some okay, that was it. But catch Rob's talk. Now, Thomas. Yeah, so, so the way we automated these things today, right? So I'll, I'll give you, I'll paint a scenario and then we'll see how it fits, right? So, so um, Australia wants to help Indonesia. Uh, Indonesia has a lot of people living in the outskirts of urban area cities, and they, they are not connected to piped water. So they can't turn on the tap and get water, right? Uh, so th you live in a society where you can, and do you know the benefits, right? So, so what do they want to do today? So what we've done is they've, they've got something called, uh, I've forgotten what it's called now. It's, it's a results-based aid, right? So, so you, 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 sit, you agree on something, somebody executes on that, and once you've, they've proven they've executed on it, you pay for it, right? So what the, the uh, across Indonesia, I can't remember the exact numbers now, but across Indonesia they wanted to connect something like half a million households uh, to, uh, to piped water. Uh, and uh, our organization got the contract with an Australian uh, government supplier, which is a consulting organization to provide the data backbone to prove that the work was being done correctly. Right? So, so uh, they, would, they would go out, find the uh, households that met their criteria. Uh, they, they simplified it, uh, good or for bad, they simplified it and said if, if the household can afford this much electricity, uh, then it's outside of the range. Then they can afford to do this themselves. And the ones that are below that, then we can do those. So it's very simple criteria because they could go out to a household, they could they photograph the actual door, of, you know, the, the, the front of the house or the building. Uh, they get a GPS location, they fill in a form, in, you know, in a, in a phone app, 
they go in and photograph the electric supply, show that they're below the threshold, and then they, uh, uh, they submit that and say, these ones qualify. Somebody else comes and actually puts piped water in. Uh, when they're done, they report it to somebody else. They come back and photograph the same place that we're still here, and then they show the they photograph the installation and prove that prove that it's been done. Right? Um, you could hack this kind of system, but it's actually quite a lot of work for a low value to, to hack it. And it's going to show up uh, in different ways, uh, and then on 10 percent of those that. To get this, they go and actually check it again with a third-party independent person who doing this work. Uh, so, so in the area we we've been working, there's like 350 or maybe uh, maybe 250,000 households. So they've done something like 600,000 field surveys to prove that these 250,000 households get their pipe and water, uh, and that's how we did it before we were thinking blockchain. Because we started this project, uh, and, you know, how to build these types of data collection systems uh, before, uh, well, I mean, Bitcoin probably existed at that point, but you know, I've not thought about it in any way or form in that shape. So that's an, one example of how we use, essentially, uh, modern technology to reproduce our own paper system. You could have done this more or less on a piece of paper, sort of, right? Somebody authorizing it, stamping it. Yeah, we actually have stamps in several of our offices because we can't send in documents to the government without the stamp. It, it's, it's kind of funny. Yeah. But, but, but we could have replicated this paper-based or the other way around. We did replicate more or less the paper-based system into digital, and it's way better than the paper-based system, but it's still not where we could get to. So that's a description of the case, right? So in that kind of context, if you have a huge software platform which Apple has to maintain, the handling of money is done outside of the software platform through the banking system. All the evidence is stored in different databases from the payment information. And the mobile devices are running fundamentally different software from the same payment or the evidence handling. Yeah, and the Australian government demands paper proof that each and single one of these has been done, we kind of negotiated them to the point where they would take a PDF file for instead. So, so each each of these transactions, the four before and after pictures and everything, we downloaded it, formatted it, dumped it into PDF formats, and sent, I don't know, 600,000 pages of work of PDF and said, here's the proof. Uh, because they, I mean, you're right. print, <laughs> print, <laughs> printing the paper was just not an option. Right? Cubic meters. But, but we actually got them to accept yeah. digital, wow. You know. <laughs> so, within the next five to ten years, I think we could all imagine a blockchain solution where you've got a bunch of, uh, oh, the phone's over there, a bunch of wallety stuff on your phone that takes pictures, stamps the pictures, sticks at least a hash of the picture on the blockchain, maybe stores the picture at IPFS. You know, that goes to some kind of oracle that looks at the pictures and decides whether the picture actually indicates the job is done. If so, the money is released. If the oracle is found to give you too many false positives, you go back and you sue the oracle and you claim a little insurance. Right? The money audit trail can be tracked to exactly where the payment originated. You can take five or six different kinds of money from different donors, combine them into a single program and still track where the money went. And all of that stuff is more or less naturally going to drop out of the mainstream deployment of the commercial blockchain solutions in the next few years of commercial or open source. So you know, what I want to illustrate here is that this is a real world example where a relatively simple financial process is supported by a hundred person organization. And if that 100 person organization could take this process and automate it down to 15 people, including the fundraisers, that would leave a whole bunch of engineers who could go on to the next thing, which might be using drones to automatically assess the health of wells and uh, you know, water collection sites across, say, Western Africa. Because you've already got, what, do you say 15,000 water points left? 
So, so, so we go, we go probably closer to somewhere between five and five hundred thousand and eight hundred thousand water points oh. map in, in West Africa. Okay. But, but, <laughs> but, but it, it's interesting, right? Because the, the, uh, the, there was a, there was an example in the keynote in the morning that said, you know, if we want to help people, we want to give them some money and they want to see that the money we gave actually did what it's supposed to do as opposed to disappearing corruption or just being frittered away on you know too much overhead or whatever. And, and it, there's a real danger there because I, I, um, I've been subscribing to that transparency part of can we, can we make this better? Can we reduce corruption? Can we make uh, international development more effective? Because um, we kind of used to say it's uh, you know, some of it works, some of it doesn't, but we don't know which part works right? because there's really no data to support it properly. Right? Uh, but the risk is that you end up sitting here in Oslo, deciding that in Namibia they need a school, and you want to track it down to we bought the bricks, right? Can I see that the bricks were bought? So do you actually think that you can sit here in Oslo and micromanage what the people in the village in Namibia actually need. Uh, we see a lot of these types of projects in international development that, I, that, that don't really work that well because we have decided, I, I'm Swedish, so in Sweden we've decided 1% of GDP is going to international development and the agencies are overwhelmed with money. <laughs> they, they can't actually process this really well. Uh, and then they end up sort of doing things that don't work so well. Uh, because we, we decided policy, but that it kind of doesn't work. Uh, not all of it is bad, but it's really hard to see which part works, which doesn't. There's some stuff that works really well. But, but in this kind of case, with a, somebody in Namibia, you know, it's probably better just to send them the money. Because it turns out, when you look at um, people that don't have a lot of money, if you give them money, they actually handle it quite well. They're not stupid. They might not be well educated, but they're not stupid. Uh, and, and the overhead, or this, the, the, the sort of, uh, what should we say, the money that goes frittered away on things that might not be their best interest, is actually less overhead than the overhead of the machine that tries to do good. I, I, I've, I've seen, it, there's no strange case, you know, the Dutch government will give money to a Dutch, another entity of the government, that will give it to an NGO, that will give it to an NGO in the country, that will give it to a contractor to build something for a school that the kids are going to get, you know, fresh water and sanitation. We're now at seven levels. What do you think the overhead is? Right? What if we just send the money to the parents is here, from here to there. Right? So, so here is where some of our uh, blockchain work might actually become really useful. Right? So we have to be careful where we apply it and think why are we doing it this way? So we are just not automating something that may not be the best thing to automate. So we, because we end up with something bad that runs really effectively. <laughs> so there has been projects like that in Kenya where they have this in pesos system. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So they can do right that because yeah. everybody who has a phone can receive money. Yeah, and it has been very successful. Yeah. It's incredibly successful. It's so the best way Absolutely. to help the people is to send them ten dollars yeah. a month. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. That's enough. Yeah. Absolutely. Um, you know, imagine if we had tracking for where that money was spent, we could do real fair ball. And, and, and there are other things we nearly done. Right? There, yeah, are, there are other things that are good about it, and that's instead of the government listening to what the World Bank thinks they need to do, they listen to what their constituents think they need to do, so it becomes better democracy. Great. On that note, thank you. <laughs>